Okay. All right. So I guess we're getting started here. Um, let me start my clock. There we go. Thank you for the sh. Okay. So this is a talk on security metaphors. Uh, this is the marketing slide. You know, this is the company that brought me here. It's my company. Thanks to me. Moving on. Let me introduce myself. This is me. As you can see, I've been at this for a while. And this is what I do. Okay. This is a presentation from a paper that I wrote on the use of metaphor in security, Met specifically metaphor and incident response. This presentation is about language. It's about how language informs our thoughts and how our thoughts form the language, forming this constant loop that really affects what we do. Basically, language is our reality. The fundamental point of the talk is in IT, we tend to communicate with far too little attention to what our audience needs. We often agree as to what individual words mean, but complex ideas can take time to explain, and concepts build on concepts. This is particularly true in technology, where concepts get deeper and deeper and deeper the further you go. You, know, you can always go further down the rabbit hole, but the question is how far down do you actually need to go to result in the communication you need? Fast communication has ambiguity in it. So the solution is to focus on metaphor. You know, metaphor, something is used to represent something else, and it can build a framework that you can use to communicate with others. Security in particular requires a focus on safety and on protection. So there are different ways that security, is, security metaphors are used. You know, one is, you know, with security, you need to have a willingness to slow down, stop, and assess what's really going on. Um, you can also, wow, that got loud. Uh, you can also look at security as speed, you know, as fast, reliable communication. And you can, look at, um, you can look at it as conflict, okay? You see the structure used a lot in the way that metaphor is explored and discussed within the field. You know, it's you know, argument as conflict, thing one as thing two. This model comes from a seminal book called uh, Metaphors We Live By by Lakoff and Johnson. Anybody read that book? Okay. It is an incredibly dense tome. I started reading it thinking it would be an interesting treatise on how language works. And in fact, it was a fundamental precept of linguistic philosophy. Not quite what I was expecting. Um, this is, sorry, this is not working for me. Let's do this. This feels much better. All right. So one of the, th the things, is this a problem? Oh, OK. Uh, one of the things that you see in this sort of uh, study is uh, language being used uh, with uh, certain things that you see over and over again. So you hear things like, uh, here claims are indefensible. You know, he attacked every weak point in my argument, and his criticisms were right on target, or I demolished his argument. This is all language around the concept of conflict and war. And if you start in this sort of communication, then you sort of set the groundwork for further communication like this. If you start down a conflict, an argument as conflict metaphor, that conflict is gonna frame the language you use for that entire discussion, and it's gonna frame the, the way you think about it in the future. Basically, metaphor ties amorphous concepts, such as working through disagreement, compromise, understanding others, into more easily understood physical examples. Metaphor is used generally, but what general means can vary. Specific industries use specific metaphors. Okay, I've worked in the banking field, I've worked in IT, I've worked in small development shops. Each one of those fields tends to get their own set of language that works to kind of explain what's going on. You know, metaphor frames the thought, and this is how people get stuck. Okay, um, if anybody worked in one computer language for a really long time and found it difficult to transition to another language, anybody experience that? Okay, in the States where I'm from, there are a lot of out of work COBOL programmers. It's not that they're bad programmers. 
It's that they've worked with one language, one frame of thought for so long, there's this extra barrier to get over to go and do something new. And the longer you stay stuck in a single metaphor, the harder it is to break out. Um, you know, ideas form language and language forms ideas, so you get this loop structure. Now, has anybody heard the story of the watches? Does that mean anything up here? Okay. Long time ago, there was a country called Switzerland. The country's still there, but back in the day, uh, Switzerland was known for making these absolutely gorgeous, wonderful watches. And it was a real mark of uh, pride and workmanship to get this fancy watch. And uh, eventually, there's this other little country called Japan that said, we have a different idea as to what a watch is. And they created this little digital thing that was remarkably cheap. And at least the first one I got, if you smacked it hard on the right-hand side, would reset to 12 o'clock. Um, very different thing than the Swiss, you know, the Swiss watches. But as time went by, you know, they got more and more capabilities, they got more and more reliable, and eventually they turned into this. Hmm. And it's talking to me. Um, so we have these new devices that, um, this is gonna keep talking to me, okay. Um, we have these devices that have replaced what watches are and very few people have watches anymore. Now that's starting to shift, but fundamentally what happened was there was this concept as to what a watch was, and the concept shifted, and an entire country, an entire industry failed because the metaphor of time changed in human society. That's the power that metaphor has. You know, well-chosen metaphors promote understanding, Poorly selected metaphors inhibit understanding. You don't see changes to the environment and you get stuck doing the wrong things. We see this in our industry with APT. This is advanced persistent threat. This is a term originated by the US military to refer to attacking nations without mentioning them by name. This is because if you mention certain attacking nations by name, you know, it's like summoning Betelgeuse and uh, suddenly they're there and you have to deal with them. So, you know, using this term uh, became popular within the military industrial complex and then it sort of started leaking out. And the metaphor shifted every time it jumped. We had the concept of attackers as nation states and that became attackers as APT, which became APT as advanced malware, which became APT as malware, which became anti-malware vendors as APT solutions, which doesn't make any sense if you go back to the beginning of the metaphor, but it uh, was very useful marketing-wise, and the marketing engine just sort of took the metaphor and ran with it. This is a metaphor, metaphorical failure because people were doing ad hoc mapping and just sort of letting the industry change what things meant. You also see metaphors as communication accelerators. There's been a lot of research here with linguistics, philosophy, and psychology. Basically, the thought was metaphor was a replacement for factual statements, and it turns out that's not true. It turns out the human brain intrinsically thinks in terms of metaphor. The brain requires metaphor to handle complexity. It's, it's a lot like the old story of you know, when, you, when maps were new. If you wanted a truly accurate map, it had to be as large as the world. You know, the brain would need to be as large as the universe to conceive of the universe if we didn't have this concept of metaphor that was simplifying things and sort of stereotyping and, and you know, allowing us to think about things in a different way. Has anybody here heard me talk about the monkey brain story? This is a different audience than I normally talk to. Okay. I, uh, the monkey brain story is one of my favorite psych studies ever done because you, know, you always get interesting things that happen if you give a group of graduate students uh, electrodes and say, stick these in people's brains and see what happens. In this case, they uh, took some monkeys and they started mapping the way they count, neuron by neuron. And uh, they found these neuron clusters and if they showed the monkey a banana, the neuron cluster representing the concept of one would light up. They showed them two bananas, 
two, the, the neuron cluster representing two would light up. Three bananas would get three, but when you showed them four bananas, three, four, and five lit up, which means there's a neurological voting process at work. When you showed them five bananas, five lit up in the middle, but you also got four and three, and you got six and seven, which means that primates count one, two, three, four-ish, five-ish, kind of looks like six, and holy crap, that's a lot of bananas. <laughs> and this matters because metaphor is weak. You know, it's very powerful as a tool, but fundamentally, it's weak. It works like a funhouse mirror. Each person has a different set of mirrors. Each person has a different set of neurons. The same words that you use can result in different understandings. It's basically a form of lossy compression used by the human brain. And factual statements, the technical language we're more comfortable in, serves as a checksum. So communication is like a TCP packet set, where you're constantly bouncing ideas back and forth, clarifying the language you use with each cycle so that you get people on the same, you know, same model reshaping the language as you go along. And the better you get at it, you know, you form your own jargon, and that's how the language forms specific industries. It can also work as communication acceleration. This works better the closer people are, whether by race, class, race, culture, uh, age, things like that. You know, anywhere there's a gap, the process of communication is slowed. You know, a younger person talking to an older person, a person from Canada talking to somebody like me from the US, you know, there are some things, there are tacit communication assumptions that don't apply, and you have to bridge those. Um, in the US right now, there's an immigration debate about whether or not people should be allowed to come and live, and the problem there is that, you know, when people started coming to the US, you know, way back when the country was founded, uh, everybody was welcome because there were all sorts of resources and more people were needed. Then it gradually became people were coming to get a job. But during times of economic uncertainty, person X coming in to get a job turned into person X coming in to get my job. And that's a gap. That's a fundamentally difficult gap to overcome because the exact same language used by two different people mean completely different things. Fundamentally, communication is an iterative process. It's focused on speed, but it's fundamentally imperfect. And metaphor can, needs to be constantly tuned to make this work. To succeed, you have to focus on the gaps because metaphors can break down. Metaphors fail or break down when they're overly restrictive or they fail to extend. Uh, there are several good examples from Scott Graneman's Security Analogy Project. Anybody know about this project? It, it didn't get as much play outside of St. Louis as it should have, uh, but it's, it was brilliant. Because what he did was he went around to everybody he knew and decided to ask them, you know, how do you communicate about security? And gathered all of these analogies together. One analogy was denial of service as a phone call system. Okay? You have all of these people making phone calls to an individual and uh, calling the phone over and over again, the calls overwhelm that person. Now, there's a breakdown, because what a phone call means is generational. If you're talking to somebody in their 50s, phone calls just sort of come in, you pay, they ring, you pick up the phone, you answer them. If you talk to somebody in their 80s or 90s, they might remember when phone calls were, um, you know, basically man in the middle by the, uh, by the, um, yeah, the operator, thank you, I, I lost the word. Um, if you talk to somebody younger, phone calls come on cell phones. That's fundamentally different because phone calls are intrinsically tied with the concept of caller ID. So you know who's calling. And as soon as that concept of what a phone call is has changed, the metaphor fails. Because if you have caller ID, denial of service is no longer like a set of phone calls because you can pick and choose who you want to answer. So what Scott had to do was extend the basic metaphor and uh, say, you know, the person's a receptionist, they don't have caller ID, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you have to change the metaphor you're using to work with the audience you're talking to. Another metaphor he used was adware's paparazzi. 
Basically, it's adware that's downloaded in the guise of a useful program. It follows you around the internet, logging all the sites you go to, the purchases you make, the ads you look at, and it sends the information to a third party, just like the paparazzi. It's highly intrusive. But this breaks down because, generally speaking, the paparazzi is not funded by overseas intelligence operatives trying to steal information out of businesses. You know, it's, um, so the metaphor can only extend so far. Another example is storage is shelves. Okay, the, this is one that I thought was absolutely brilliant because he basically said file systems are like file boxes on shelves. And you have this data that you want and uh, you, know, you might not have enough to fill a box so you just toss it in. And over time, the boxes fill up and at some point you get this really big set of paper that has to go in and you have a piece in this box and a piece in that box and a piece in that box, which is why you need to defrag systems sometimes. Um, you know, you need to have indices. Now, it's complicated because in this metaphor, different types of file systems have different types of indices. You know, if you're using ext2, 3, or 4, the indices are all kind of similar. NTFS is different. If you're on an old, uh, you know, or a new, I suppose, IBM i-series or AS400, it's a completely different model. The metaphor doesn't work at all. And uh, this metaphor, metaphor also breaks down based on age. People that uh, are younger, don't store paper. You know, people, the, the one generation younger than me scan absolutely everything in. They don't have a single filing cabinet. I have one filing cabinet. My father has four. You know, it, it, it changes how things work. IT is rich in metaphor, okay? We, we use it a lot because the concepts we need to communicate are so weird, so different from other things that have been done. In order to get anything done, we have to use metaphor to discuss it. You know, but it breaks down. You know, we used to use the, con the metaphor of information superhighway to represent the internet. But that broke down because the internet got really big, more people started to understand it, they realized it wasn't really like an information superhighway, it was more like trucks, you know, it, 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 sorry, it wasn't like trucks, it was more like a series of tubes, right? So, you know, these things shift over time. There's this project that I, um, in 2008, uh, run by not exactly the US government, it was this academic government uh, group uh, that was designed to create new information security metaphors. And it's a great project to look at uh, because there are common metaphors that we've used for years. And they started by looking at those. They looked at the idea of security as a fortress or a castle. They looked at security as cops and robbers. They looked at security as warfare. Then they started concept mining. And concept mining is one of the most fun projects you can do because you just look at, you know, how do other groups communicate? What can we take from what they do? And uh, they started looking at biology, medical fields, economics, things like that, and came up with these other ideas. They wanted to create something like a cyber Richter scale where you could actually rate and index dangers. But it fails horribly because the Richter scale is based on amplitude measurements. You know, you actually have physical measurements you're measuring, and uh, it's completely unambiguous. In IT, you wind up with people arguing, is this a seven or is this a nine? And they're gonna spend all of this time, is it a seven or is it a nine, instead of actually getting people out of the building before it falls down. Architecture metaphor is based on building in security. You know, it's, um, you know we get fails there, because we are not actually building buildings for most of us. I mean, how many people have actually got to build a network system from scratch? How many have had to walk in and deal with what you've been dealt? Okay. Our security as architecture only works if you're allowed to build new. And if you're in an environment where you're not allowed to build new, then it's gonna completely fail because all these people are saying, you know, you need to build it at the beginning, you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way, and it's like, I can't do any of that. I'm stuck with this crumbling ramshackle building, what do I do? Um, another metaphor they found was based on wellness. You know, this is basically measuring health. And uh, you guys in Canada are actually much better at this than we are in the States. But uh, still, health is a very hard thing to put a number on. You know, you can't wake up and say, I'm feeling 30% healthy today. You know, it, it doesn't work. And if you can't do it in the medical field, how can you even try to do it in the IT field? You know, 
you know, what is a cold? What is a disease? How is that going to work? Are you going to wind up arguing over what's Trojan, what's a virus, you know, what's crypto locker? It's kind of a worm. It's kind of not. You can argue about what's going on uh, on things like that. So as you understand metaphor, you can understand how metaphor breaks down. And uh, this results in choosing your favorite metaphors. They're the ones that work best for you. Now, I ran a contest last year. And uh, the basic idea was to collect the metaphors that other people were using. Uh, I had an extra ticket to DerbyCon. The winner you know, was going to get the ticket. So uh, Kendall Bailey actually won. And I ended up getting um, uh, about 15 metaphors that I could play with. So some metaphor, three metaphors that I got that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, this is your basic security as a castle metaphor. I don't know if anybody can read it, but um, security is like a castle. You know, we've got walls, moats, archers, guards, a drawbridge. And the bit that Michael Smith added that I really liked is most castles have this little secret door that you use to get out or get provisions in if you're actually under attack which means that the core of the metaphor is around untrustworthy people. Because the castle, the, the security structure, is built with a designed hole that you need. It's a back door you have to have in there. And uh, it results in, if attacks focus not on the structure, but on the people, then uh, you wind up having a point of vulnerability. The metaphor is very useful in thinking about the fact that there is no perfect security. Even if you build this massive castle, you can be sieged and everybody can die. So you have to have this point of vulnerability to get in. But it breaks down because it's a metaphor about the trust of people. If you're talking to somebody that says, we can trust all of our people, then you know, the discussion's going to end. You, know, you then have to have a discussion about trust. You're no longer talking about the security piece you originally wanted to talk about. Another example was Shauna's, which is that of going to a doctor for the first time. You know, if you've been skipping the doctor for a long time, you go there for the first time in 20 years, there are going to be a lot of problems. Which one do you deal with? What's actionable out of this? What's interesting is the core of her metaphor is the younger you are, the more you can change. You know, security fits at the beginning of a project. So it works great if you're talking to people that are health conscious. But if you're talking to people that haven't gone to the doctor in a long time, um, you know, they, might not, they might not resonate with this metaphor. Another metaphor um, was uh, the, man, the manned submarine metaphor. Basically, a submarine is useless without people. You have to both protect people and move them from point to point. You have to be careful with the doors. If you open up a submarine door, you're underwater, there could be a problem. You might want to have security issues around that. Um, submarines exist to both keep people in, but also to keep the water out. If you only do one of the two, you're going to have a problem. Um, and you have to have a breach plan. You, know, you should probably reassess your breach plan whenever you've been exposed to water. You know, there are a lot of insights here. I thought this was an absolutely wonderful metaphor. It's highly useful. It's highly extensible. It's highly flexible. It's fast, it communicates a security concepts in a way that's easy to understand, and it's completely derailed by somebody who asks, what's a submarine? In the US, we're a highly militaristic culture with two coasts. We know what submarines are. We went through World War II. A lot of people that we personally know lived and worked on submarines. If you're talking to somebody in a landlocked country in the middle of Africa, it's probably not going to work. The audience is critical in this type of communication. Another example of this is football. You know, in business, you often find sports metaphors. Uh, this particular example uh, uses the concept of the firewall as a defensive line, other technologies as linebackers, good code as cornerbacks, uh, web application firewalls as safeties, the SOC as coaches, the lead serves as the defensive coordinator. Like the submarine analogy, it's very flexible, but it's a complete failure if you don't understand football. I have never understood football. I've tried. I go to Super Bowl parties that my friends throw. We watch the ads. I completely glaze over when the game's going on. And um, what happened here is this, this is what spoke to me out of the metaphor. That is kind of what I'd understood. 
And this metaphor worked backwards for me. It helped me understand football. Before I uh, saw this metaphor, I had no idea what some of these people did. You know, they're just guys running around on the field. What do I care? Give me the commercial with the cats again. <laughs> to be successful, metaphors have to be selected to facilitate communication. And the introduction of a metaphor should decrease complexity of the communication itself, which is where we get into incident response. In incident management, we tend to focus on the technical. You know, we sort of have to because we have to understand what happened. We have to reverse engineer the attack and find ways to prevent it. Implementing defense requires communication. You often have to require new technology, acquire additional resources, increase your budget, or spin the event to the media. Other industries are really good at this. You've got PR firms that spin and frame disasters, finance and insurance firms that discuss risk, and you get rapid technological deployment that you use in startups. In IT, we're still learning. So let's look at some of these. In 2009, ApacheCon.com experienced a privilege escalation attack, and they released a report. And the report said big letters up at the top, you know, no coder users were at risk. There was a big focus on the metaphor of um, intrusion as physical access. This is a good metaphor, but it's misleading. Because when you copy things, you're not really stealing things. You know, how can you really say it's theft if what's stolen isn't lost? You know, in the language they used, they said logs were destroyed. But not really. You know I mean, how do you destroy a log? If, if you have good backups, can a log truly be destroyed? Are you going in and, and physically chopping it up with a chainsaw like you do with a physical log? Not, not necessarily. Um, hmm, hang on a second. Okay. In 2010, there was another attack. That's what this one is down here. This was an attack against JIRA and Confluence. This, there was another banner here saying that they suffered a direct targeted attack. There was no actual data necessarily lost. They didn't want to focus on that. They really wanted to say, oh, poor us, we've suffered a direct targeted attack, which is interesting because that's victim language. And when you use victim language in talking about a problem, you shift the discussion from what happened to a discussion about responsibility. There's a concept of victim is blameless that tends to lead people to pick up language like this. Um, it works well in a cultural perspective. We're seeing this a lot in uh, the shame-based culture that's developing around the rape culture uh, that is in this international conversation we're seeing. Culturally speaking, it's good because it punishes ill action, but it fails because social pressure only works against those that are members of a community. And when you use victim blaming language in an incident report, if the attackers are not part of the community, there's no shame and it's gonna be completely ineffectual. All it's going to do is pull the point of the conversation away from how do we deal with it, how do we fix it, to oh poor us. And that's not actually gonna make things better. The final example for Apache is in 2012, there was a configuration error. And basically, if you typed your password in wrong, trying to access some systems, the passwords would appear in the logs, the logs that were centralized. They were centralized because of the destroyed logs from 2009. There was no loss here, so there was no banner. And what you see is a technical report that has very little metaphor use in it at all because the audience is technical in nature. So, you know, there's less of a gap that needs to be bridged, so you are able to use more jargon, more language, you know, more technical-based language. Another example is uh, FreeBSD. This happened in 2012. Um, FreeBSD, as I'm sure most of you know, is a highly technical group. The people that use FreeBSD and the people that design and, and promote FreeBSD are in many cases the same people. So what we wound up with for this, this breach report 
was an extremely technical report that assumed massive amounts of shared background. Um, almost no metaphor, you know, so there was no, you know, nothing of terrible interest there. Now, FreeBSD can get away with this because their user base is self-selected. Metaphors have to consider their audience. Ad hoc metaphors are a crapshoot. I mean, do you think Apache could get away with this? Apple is based in some ways on FreeBSD. Could they get away with a report that's highly technical and just goes through the specifics, this is what happened? You know, if there's you know, no uh, shared experience, you have to bridge the gap. You can overlap. You have to worry about overlap with existing metaphors, you have to, which can result in confusion. You have to worry about c conflict with existing metaphors. You can have metaphors that are diametrically opposed to one another. So the solution, if you're trying to communicate with others outside of your realm of expertise, is to pre-select the metaphors to speed the understanding, which is where metaphor mapping comes from. Now, has anybody here seen the Forrester Report planning for failure? Probably not. Okay. So Forrester comes out with these reports that, from my perspective, feel a lot like marketing. There's not a lot that's terribly new of terrible interest there. But this one paper came up with uh, some interesting concepts around the types of people that are involved in incidents and how you, how you need to deal with them. So it broke it down into different groups. You know, one group was you know, all of the employees, the people not technically directly involved, just the people working for a company that have experienced a breach. For companies like this, there's little shared background. You know, you can't just explain this is what happened at a technical level. You give people, you know, an average employee a technical, um, you know, network dump, it's not going to mean anything to them. So you pick metaphors that will. You know, you can look at school as a point of commonality, which, you know, security is learning. You can look at family using security as protection. Uh, you can look at vehicles and homes, security is maintenance. You know, these are the things you have to do on a regular basis. Just like you change the oil in your car, you have to patch your systems regularly. That sort of thing tends to work well for a general audience. If you're talking to other people in IT, there's much more shared background. You can talk more technically. But if you're a Linux admin trying to talk to a Windows admin, there's a gap that's going to have to be overcome. If you're talking to developers, if you're talking to database people, you know, there are some assumptions that have to be bridged. So you, know, you, can, you can bring similarities of Linux services to Windows services. You can remap security concepts to more general technical issues. If you're talking to a developer, a runaway service attack, uh, a, sorry, denial of service attack could be like a runaway process. They have to deal with those. They don't have to deal with DDoS very much. You can look at uh, remote code execution as you know, having a system that people stayed logged into that somebody then took over. If you're talking to the public relations group, you know, they're good at selecting metaphors. You know, understand the skill level of the people you're talking to. PR's job is to translate metaphor to metaphor for other people. So you can often just tell them this is what happened, fall back on the all-employee metaphors and let them translate to others. That's their job. Law enforcement can be tricky. If you're talking to law enforcement, um, you know, they tend to form an isolated culture. Anybody here part of law enforcement? Okay, one person. Hi. Um, so I've done a little bit of work with the FBI. And uh, one of the things that I found interesting, because you know, when you start going into something like that, you're a little hesitant. You know, I've heard these things about the FBI. Am I going to want to work with them? And what I found is, as I worked with them, every single person I worked with was absolutely wonderful. They were highly driven. They knew what they wanted to do. And more importantly, they knew what they didn't know. And they were able to say, I need help on this. Okay, completely different from working with other aspects of law enforcement that I've worked with. But you know, those people were great. And they get this really bad rap because one of the things they're bad at is communicating through metaphor. So they let the newspapers and media really spin everything they do and uh, sort of starts to fail. With law enforcement, you can have highly productive conversations by focusing not on the technical, but on why it matters. They exist to protect people, like we exist to protect systems, and if we're lucky, to protect people as well. There's commonality there, 
and by focusing there and using metaphors to talk about what's going on, you know, you can really succeed with metaphors like security as protection, uh, security as damage, and security as capture. If you're talking to peer incident response teams, suppose there's an incident that's industry-wide and you have to work with other companies. You know, it's a lot like IT, but there's a wider gap. You know, there's more possibilities in the types of technology that can be used, so spend some time mapping experiences and adjust for technical background. If you need to work with uh, different business units, they have different areas of focus. This is where stereotypes really come in. You, know, you can talk to the finance group with security as loss. You can talk to customer service as security as customer damage. Customer service doesn't care if the server's down. They care if the server being down causes them to get additional calls. So focus on what's important to them. So industries have their own metaphors. After all, that's why they're industries. Remember, metaphor forms thought, thought forms metaphor, so you get the cyclical effect. You seldom have time to do a complete map, but there are some interesting observations. People that work in manufacturing tend to use process or flow-based metaphors. You know, you can often talk about networks as water flowing through or as a conveyor belt taking things, you know, through the environment. You can talk to medical groups about security as patient risk, uh, security as patient improvement. Uh, antivirus as vaccination works really well with schools and with medical groups and very terribly with homeschoolers. You know, think about what the metaphor means to the person you're talking to. This has been studied in great detail in an excellent book called Images of Organization by Gareth Morgan. It's bigger than Metaphors We Live By, but much more accessible. I strongly recommend anybody in business read that book. It's fantastic. So with metaphor mapping, you have to select what you're using. And uh, this is studied in great deal by social engineers. I'm not going to be giving a social engineering talk, so you know, just trust me on it. Um, but to simplify, look at the stereotype of the people you need to talk to. Look at age. You know, generations communicate better within the generation than between generations. Look at races. Different races and different cultural upbringings tend to result in specific use of language within those in-groups. Same thing happens with classes. If people have a certain set of economic options, they think about resources differently than people that have more or less opportunity economically. Hobbies are a good source, you know, baseball, cooking, photography, stuff like that. You know, basically, people understand best what they already know. So if you have to regularly communicate with different people, think about who they are. You know, if you're talking about somebody who really likes to fish, learn a bit about fishing. If you're talking to somebody who's a chef, who goes home and cook, learn a little about, cook, about cooking, learn about food prep, learn how those sorts of metaphors can work for you. If somebody's a baseball fan, learn a little bit about the game. If somebody's a football fan, give up, it's completely incomprehensible. <laughs> People will not attempt to understand you until you attempt to understand them. So how do you do this? We're gonna talk a little bit about, a little bit about personas. Uh, this is used in agile development. So specific personas are often used in Agile Dev to help define applications and systems, how to design, and how they'll be worked with. Names help, generalities help, but specifics help more. You have to be careful, though, with stereotypes. Basically, metaphors function as lossy compression. Okay, I mentioned that before. Metaphors allow you to frame people and to move faster but you run the risk in using stereotypes and metaphors of trapping real people in fake boxes. And you have to be willing to recognize when that happens and start backing away. Use them, but only if it helps you communicate and understand. Now, I'm gonna go through three quick examples and then wrap up. The stereotypes that I'm using are the stereotypes of the people I encounter. Based on where I'm from, that means these are upper Midwest US-based personas. You're gonna to need to adjust the personas based on the people you encounter. So, this first person, this first persona, his name is George, he's white, he's college educated, he's a 50-year-old bank manager. He uses a computer, but mostly just for email and web browsing. He's divorced, 
He has three kids. One of the kids is starting a family. He's got one grandchild. One kid is still in college, one's still living at home. George likes to grill outside on nice days. He attends church, but not regularly. And he's dating a woman 15 years his younger, which may have been a factor in the divorce. He played basketball in college, has fond memories of it, votes regularly as Republican, and is renting a house because his ex-wife kept the first house. So what does this mean to us? This means if we need to talk to George about security, you can use security as learning. He went to college, he's gonna like that. He's gonna understand what we're talking about. He can use security as doing what's right. He votes Republican, you know, he's a family person, he's conservative, he's gonna resonate with, you know, this is what we need to do because it's right, not necessarily this is what we should do if for other reasons. Security is cooking steaks or fish. He likes to grill. You know, baking metaphors might not work. Very hard to bake a cake on a grill. But, you know, some things will. Security is basketball. You know, use, if you're going to use a sports metaphor, use a sports metaphor he's going to understand. And security is protection because he has the family. Another person is Dana. Dana's black, college educated, skilled with computers, but as an end user only. 23-year-old insurance agent, she's entrepreneurial, also running her own party planning business. She's dating, but it's not very serious about it. She has credit card debt because of you know, things she did in her youth. She currently regrets the, death, the debt, but not what she did in her youth. She's very religious, attending church every Sunday, volunteers at the church, also volunteers at Big Brother, Big Sister, votes occasionally, always democratic, dislikes sports, likes to read, mostly likes to read mysteries. So this means what's going to resonate is security is self-improvement. Given her culture and the fact that she went to college, self-improvement's likely to resonate with her. Security is risk, works well when you're talking to entrepreneurs. Security is duty, works well with religious people. Security is learning, based on her reading and the fact she did go to college, is going to work well. Security is discovery, since she likes metaphors, will work well as well. And security as helping others, given that she volunteers a lot, that language is going to work well for her, too. Last person is Tommy. Tommy is second generation Vietnamese, high school educated. Highly skilled in computers, self-taught, 35-year-old database administrator. He has a long-term boyfriend, no plans to get married. He's not involved politically, lives with two dogs. Technically Buddhist, not very serious about it. Financially stable, saving for retirement. Learns about one computer language per year has actively avoided business stuff his entire career. And he's thought by managers to be highly abrasive, particularly in meetings. But the technical staff love him because he solves problems well. Tommy's metaphors would involve security as learning. He's self-motivated, but avoiding security as education because he only went to college. He only went to high school. He stopped before he got to college. Focusing on security analogies is going to work well. Uh, Linux security is Microsoft security. Document security is data security. You know, those concepts are going to bridge well. You know, once he gets one, he'll be able to get the others. And security is improvement. As technological improvement works well. Highly technical people like to make technology do new things because it's fun, because it's neat to see how far you can take tech. So that's likely to work well for him. If you like this, um, these are some of the resources I used. The actual paper has more resources. Paper is available here. I don't know if anybody's going to scan that. I don't see any phones coming up. Okay, you can grab it later. Um, it also, I turned my talks into comic books. This particular talk isn't a comic book yet, but my lean security talk is. So you can go ahead and snap that if you're interested. And uh, don't see any phones coming up for that either. So question time. Any questions? No questions. All right, I guess we're done.